or time to get involved. Let's see if we can go a bit longer. Okay, well, I think it's five o'clock, so um, we will be starting. I'm just going to let you guys know that. Okay, so hello and welcome to the first of our Facebook Live seminars. Before we start, just a few bits of housekeeping. This is obviously the first time we've done this, this is the first time we've tried this, so I cannot guarantee that this is going to be perfect. I cannot guarantee that the technology will work perfectly and that it will be the best quality ever, despite the fact that I have a very good quality uh, camera on my mobile, it is only a mobile, and I have very poor quality internet, which may cause you some streaming issues, it may not look the best quality. I can't really help that, all of my neighbours are on the internet, I don't have super fast broadband, I don't have control over that. So, whilst you're what? <coughs> Whilst you're watching the video, you can engage with it uh, through the chat and I can see your comments and your questions as they come up. Please be aware that there is about a 30 second delay between what I'm saying right now and what you guys are seeing. So that means that if you ask a question, I'm not going to see it for a while. So what I'm going to do is at the end of each small section, I'll have a look. If there are any immediate questions to answer, I'll answer them. And at the very end, we'll have time for questions and I will go through and answer any questions that you put there. If you go to the Chestnut Ridge Facebook page, there's also a discussion post. On there, you can discuss anything that we've talked about in today's seminar. You can share any of your own tips and tricks. And for this one in particular, maybe you've got some horses that you want to breed allocate to and you need a bit of help and advice. Maybe they're posing a little bit of a problem for you. Post them on there and then other people can help you out. Okay, so the final thing to say is that everything I say in this video, as with all my videos and all my content, is my own opinion. I'm not representing anyone, this is just my opinion of what I think. I'm an experienced judge, but I'm by not by no means the most experienced judge in the world. I've only judged in the UK, and things may be different in the jurisdiction where you live. If you're in the USA, if you're in Germany, if you're in Russia, all of those other areas where there are lots of model horse shows, there may be your own rules, there may be your own requirements, and there may be your own breed standards. So please make sure you look up what the situation is in your own area and always check with show holders if you're not sure about something. So have a quick sip of tea and uh, then we will begin. So today's seminar is going to cover three main points. The first thing we're going to talk about is how to allocate breeds for your model horses. We're then going to talk about how to research breeds so that you can back up that allocation. And we're finally going to talk about some common pitfalls. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how we allocate a breed. First of all, I, what I'd like to say is this. If a model is an Arab, a model is an Arab. And this is going to be your basic starting point for allocating breeds. I know that some classes at live shows are mega competitive. We all want to get our horses out of that OF warm blood class where there are 50 or 60 entries and into maybe something like other pure where there might be like 10 or 15. But if it's a breed allocation that doesn't look anything like our horse, even if we get it into that smaller class, it's not going to place. Even if it does place because the class is so small it's placed, is it going to get a champion as that breed? Is it going to do well at BMX or NAN as that breed? Probably not. So that's a short term sort of gain with no long term rewards. It's better that you find a horse that actually is really going to excel in those classes than try and force something into being something it's not. Now some moulds simply are like this. Some moulds are simply only one breed. And I've got my first example horse here for, to show you. So this is the Ashqua mould, and this is the Premier Club release, which is the first release on this mould. This horse is an Arab. This horse cannot show as anything other than an Arab. The only exception to that is where it might be a part-bred Arab, like Shai here. Shai is obviously not a purebred Arab because he's spotted, so he's a part-bred Arab, in this case an Arabusa. I'm not going to be able to show this horse as a thoroughbred or a quarter horse or any other breed. It is what it is. It's an Arab. Other moulds have a bit more variety in them, and there are quite a lot of moulds like this. Ones like Ashkar are kind of in the minority, and they tend to be the really distinctive breeds. 
lots of moulds, even without extreme customising, can be shown as lots of different breeds. And an example of that would be the Smarty Jones mould. So this is a Frankel here that's just lost his base. But this mould is sculpted to look like a racehorse. It's a thoroughbred. And if you look at this mould, you go, yeah, all right, that's a thoroughbred. Definitely looks like a thoroughbred. However, Brea have released lots of different colours in this mould and there have been lots of different re -sculpts. This is quite an interesting one here. This model has been re by Brea to look like a polo pony. Obviously, this is a custom version of the original finished model. We've got a hogged mane, we've got that tied up tail that you'd see with a polo pony. I think this is actually quite a nice polo pony. Polo ponies do tend to be really heavy thoroughbred breeding. They tend to be a bit more stockier than your traditional racehorse. And I think actually it works really, really well. The stocky nature of the mould also means that you might want to show it as a stock horse. Here we have the Dark Horse Surprise model from Brea First a couple of years ago. And as you can see, this is not a thoroughbred colour. It's quite heavy pinto, but a perfectly nice paint horse. If you had a solid one, you could definitely get away with quarter horse. If you have an Appaloosa, you can definitely get away with Appaloosa. And finally, I have here a really nice Sabino custom, and that I show as an Australian stock horse. So just on the four horses I've got in front of you here on this mould, I've got four different breeds. And some moulds are like that. So as your starting point, you're going to look at what the mould is sculpted to be. So I've got a horse that I want to allocate a breed for. I've decided I want to allocate a breed for Mason. OK, he's still in his box, but there's a point why I'm using him in his box. What shall I start with? Well, my first starting point is going to be to look at what the manufacturer has decided to be. That's quite easy with original finish because what I do is I turn my box over or I have a look on the internet listing and it says down here, a true American breed, the American Saddlebred. It says up here, American Saddlebred. And it says down here, American Saddlebred, but in another language. Brea have obviously decided that this should be an American Saddlebred. So that should be my starting point when I want to allocate my breed for this model. Start with what you know. Brea says an American Saddlebred, so let's start with that. You can do exactly the same thing if you've got a custom or a resin. So most resins are sculpted as particular breeds. And I've got an example here, which is the little Maggie Bennett Ultramax. So little Samba here has been painted to a very nice clipped chestnut. And as you can see on the little card that came with her, it says she's a thoroughbred filly. So my starting point is, OK, the sculptor sculpted this as a thoroughbred. I will start with thoroughbred. If you don't have any information, you can actually look this information up online. So say I have gone to a live show and I bought this horse here. She hasn't come with any information. I know that she is called Croy in another word I can't really pronounce, but I don't know anything else about it. That doesn't tell me what breed she is. So what I would do is I would head along to everyone's favorite website, Identify Your Brea, and I would go, what is this mould? I'd have a look, I'd scroll down, and I would discover that the mould is called Connemara Mare. Brilliant, starting point. This has been sculpted as a Connemara Mare. I can do exactly the same thing with resins and customs. So if I've got a custom, like Brutus here, I go, what am I gonna show him as? I know, I'll go on to identify your brer, I will find his mould, the Smarty Jones mould, Again, that doesn't tell me much unless I know my racehorse history. I don't know that Smarty Jones is a thoroughbred. I will have a look through some of those existing models and I'll start to see from that that they're all thoroughbreds. Maybe I'll look up the famous horses that they've sculpted after and I can go, OK, he's a thoroughbred. But that is only my starting point. With resins, it's a bit more difficult. There is a website called Equine Resin Directory, and on that you can find most resins. So if I went on there and had a look, I could find this resin. This is a horsing around resin called Pepis, and he's a very cute little foal. And that would tell me that he's a Shetland foal. It would also give me lots of pictures of completed pieces that other people have done, and the breeds that they've allocated. 
really, really good starting point for resins. Okay, so I have my starting point. I've either looked on my box, I've looked at what the mould is sculpted to be, but what if I can't do any of those things? What if I've got something that's just, none of this is working? I don't know what it is, maybe I can't find the resin online. Simple, look for advice. And this is something that I'm gonna put as a thread throughout this. We all have access to social media. I know you have access to social media because right now you are watching me on social media. Just ask other people. Hey, I've got this model, I don't really know what to show it as. Or try and look it up online, see what other people have shown it as. If you Google something like a Brea name and then show results, lots of people still put um, the horse's show results and information on websites. And you can actually find ones that have placed as a particular breed. So once you've got that, once you've got your starting point, so our starting point for those models I've shown you now, we've got starting point Connemara, we've got starting point American Saddlebred, we've got starting point Thoroughbreds, and starting point Shetland. We now need to move on to part two of this video, and that is how to research the breed. But first I'm gonna to respond to some questions that you guys have asked. So Kristen says, how do I start the process for a drastic custom? where you can't tell what mould it started at? That's a really, really good question. So the first thing I would do is to go back to the artist. Ask the artist what reference they used or what they were attempting to portray. Most artists, when they're selling a drastic custom, will tell you quite a lot about the model. They might describe it as, you know, Brea Smarty Jones drastically re-sculpted to Ackle Techy Stallion or something along those lines. They may be able to supply you with a reference photo and from that you could do something like a reverse image search and you could use that to help you along your way. If none of those avenues are open to you, you have, you've asked for advice on your line, you're not really getting anywhere. I've really, you're really going to have to start doing quite basic research and the best way to do that is going to be to use a breed book. Now we're going to talk a little bit in more detail about breed books, but the advantage of them is you can literally flick through loads of breeds and they're usually arranged by body type so I can look under heavy horses and I can flick through and say well actually this one looks kind of like my model and that's a really good starting point so definitely invest in some breed books if you haven't already most charity shops will have them you can get them cheap on eBay okay so once I've got my starting point what am I going to do well, the first thing I'm going to say is I've just talked to you about breed books. This is a sad, sad situation, guys, but you can't trust what's in books. And I've got an example. Here I have a wonderful breed book, the ultimate encyclopedia of horse breeds. This book is literally packed full of amazing pictures. As an artist, this is perfect. Look how much reference I've got. Look how big it is. Look how clear it is. As a shower, mm, less so. So it took me only a few seconds to go through this book and find something that could be misleading. It's not an error per se, but it is misleading. So I've got here the page on a Shetland Pony. Really helpful page. That's a lovely Shetland Pony. Here are some wild Shetland Ponies. Here are some Shetland Ponies with small children on. All nice Shetland Ponies. And here I've got the characteristics of the breed. Now, if we look on the colour, we can see here it says any colour except spotted. Now, that isn't wrong. Shetlands do come in any colour except spotted, with one exception. Shetland ponies can also not be champagne. It's quite an unusual colour, but if I had a model Shetland that was champagne coloured and I read that, I would, could reasonably assume that my Shetland pony could be shown as a Shetland pony. So breed books are a great starting point, but you need to take that a step further. Which brings me on to point two. You can't trust the books, and you especially cannot trust the internet. The internet is an awful, awful invention that gives us all lots of misleading and incorrect information. A particular demon of this internet are horse breed information websites. 
you know, those ones that are like horsebreeds.com or list of horse breeds or Wikipedia. Now these are long lists of different horse breeds under which they give information. Much of this might be well-referenced information, but do you see any references to breed societies? Hopefully on Wikipedia you will see references to breed societies. The whole premise of Wikipedia is that stuff is meant to be referenced. But quite famously, for a very long time, Wikipedia had horses as having too many teeth listed under their description of horse dentistry. So I wouldn't trust it implicitly. Another particularly bad vice is Pinterest. I love Pinterest. I spend hours on Pinterest and it's so good as an artist to pin reference pictures to. And I can save all my reference pictures. I've got all my albums organized by color, I've got albums organized by breed. But finding sources for those images is almost impossible. And you need to find that source. The image might look just like your horse and maybe some random person on Pinterest has described it as a breed. But actually, you do research, three hours later you find the original source of the image and you discover it's a completely different breed entirely. Do not listen to anything those captions on Pinterest say. If you've got an image you found on Pinterest, you need to find the original source. If you cannot find the original source, then you shouldn't be using it as reference for a breed because you don't know that it is what that person is saying it is. I mean, would you trust your next door neighbour to know? Are they an expert? Would you trust some random guy on the internet to know? Probably not. So, we know we can't trust anyone, we can't trust uh, our books, we can't trust our internet, so who are we going to trust? Well, where do we get information about what the breed standard is? Well, of course, we get it from breed societies. The breed society or the breed registry from the breed produces the official breed standard. So what you are going to do as a starting point for both producing your breed cards and double checking whether the breed you've chosen is correct, is you're gonna to go to the Breed Society website for that breed from its country of origin. So if I want to look up the Connemara, I'm going to go to the Irish Connemara Society. If I'm going to look up uh, Thoroughbred, I'm probably gonna to go to the Jockey Club. That's a bit more complicated. If I'm gonna look up a Shetland Pony, I'm gonna to go to the Scottish or the British Shetland Pony Associations. If I'm going to look up the American Saddlebred, I'm going to go to the American American Saddlebred Association. So I'm going to look on there and I'm going to find the breed standard. 99% of breed societies have the breed standard on their website, usually as a PDF document that you can download. Some don't and that does make it a little bit more tricky and we're going to talk about that in a second. So once you've looked at that, have a read and the first thing you're going to check is your colour is okay. Now, lots of breed standards are really restrictive in what colours they allow. So check that the colour is okay and be careful. If I'm looking up Connemara, I might think that my lovely Croy here can't be shown as one because the Connemara Breed Society says done. Well, British people don't mean done. And this is where you're going to fall into a few pitfalls and you need to really do double, double research and just know a few things. If you see done in a breed society in the UK, it means buckskin. It means that there are cream dilutes present. So any breed society you see using done, I would always double check that they mean done, as in true done with a dorsal stripe and not buckskin. You can do that quite simply by actually just looking at pictures of the horses that are registered as done, and that will tell you whether they're buckskin or done. That's a really easy, simple thing to do. If you can't find a breed registry in the country of origin and or you, as quite often happens, can't read the language that the breed society is in, have a look for the breed society in your own country. You want to do this as a second step anyway, because sometimes breed standards vary between countries. This is particularly true if you happen to be in the USA. If you're in the USA and looking up any breed from Europe, make sure to check the American standard. So if I'm in the UK and I'm looking up, say, the Percheron, and say the Percheron breed standard is only available in French, I would be perfectly entitled to read the breed standard from the British Percheron Association. Equally, if I was in America, I could read the American Percheron Association, and I would discover that there's actually quite a few differences. Maybe once this is over, you could go and have a look at some of these and compare them and see quite how different some of the colour registration for these breeds is. Okay. So I've 
done my research. I've researched what the breed standard is in the original country. I've researched it in my own country and checked for any variations or differences. I've chosen my breed. I know what I'm gonna show it as. I need to put together some reference. So I'm just gonna have a look at the questions now before we move on to putting together a reference card. So, um, Emma Hogan says that we should all learn Czech. Um, for you guys who don't know Emma, Emma picks the most obscure possible breeds ever to show her models as. Breeds that I'm pretty sure are not real breeds. But she does like to present me with all kinds of unusual foreign breeds. She does at least translate the Czech for me and give me English breed cards. I think as a judge, if people started giving me breed cards in foreign languages, I would not be too amused. I speak very limited selection of languages and none of them are Czech. So, the most important thing once you've done that research, if it's going as in as anything slightly unusual, whether it's an unusual breed or another unusual colour, is going to be your breed card. I'm just going to have a little sip of my tea and then we will talk about breed cards. Okay, so breed cards. I'm going to go through with you what I like to see as a judge in a breed card. The thread that you all need to remember whilst putting together your breed cards is what does the judge need to know. It's not about the background or the history or the fact that Franklin Roosevelt rode one of them or Medusa had one as a pet. I know she didn't have one as a pet, but none of that really matters. As a judge, I don't need to know that. I only need to know some simple things like the breed standard in order to judge your horse. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is size. Size, in the case of breed cards, does matter. Now, some shows will actually be really strict on this. There are shows that will have restrictions on the size of breed cards you can put in. Most don't, but as a general rule, you shouldn't be putting anything on the table that is bigger than A5 size. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples of breed cards now. It's just worth noting that um, although the images I use are usually under Creative Commons, most of them don't have a license for me to use them in any form of video. And because I want to upload this permanently, I've blocked those images off with post-it notes just to avoid those royalty issues. So this is the largest breed card I own. As you can see, it's laminated and it's two separate cards that I used to put next to each other. Um, and I've actually laminated them together so that I've got both of them um, for ease of use. This is for a horse called Montreal. He's a particularly tricky horse and took me quite a lot of reference because he's a splash white historical hunter. He's historical because he's docked. Anything that you're showing is docked in the UK is going to have to be shown as historical because docking is illegal. And he's splash white. Fun fact, traditionally you didn't really get coloured horses as hunters. However, I found a particular English gentleman who did like a coloured horse. As you can see in this lovely painting, when you're researching historical stuff, it's going to be paintings, not photographs. Obviously, he doesn't quite look like this particularly deformed looking creature. And I also had to prove that Splash White existed and Splash White was going to be present in Hunters. And I've, I've done that through another historical image here. There was a lot of reference and a lot of research that went into this. Um, but, you know, some judges might have just have not cared and have just placed him. But another judge may have raised these questions. And I'm going to preempt that by giving that judge those pieces of information first. Because I don't really want that judge to have to be looking it up because they're not going to look it up. So that's about as big as you really want to go. Most of my breed cards are smaller than that. So you can see that this one's like untrimmed, but really they're about this big. So you can see here a standard breed card that I would put down in the show ring. I've got the name of the breed up in the top. I've got a photograph. Unfortunately, my printer is only printing in black and white at the moment. I don't know why. Please print colour images. I've got... Um, the colour, so as we've already said, all except spotted in chestnut. I've got the height, I've got uh, the confirmation, and I've got some brief bullet points about the confirmation. Now, I would like to think that particularly in the UK, judges know what a Shetland pony is, but this was just a brief example I put together earlier. So we're going to talk 
out through the different points and what you want to do with them. So first of all, your image. Now this is where I see a lot of errors. I don't think anyone is intentionally trying to mislead judges in the show ring, but I have definitely more than once seen images put down that are either of a different breed or of a horse that's not actually registered as that breed or are just quite frankly really bad examples of the breed. You want to find an image that both looks like your model, is clear, but is also a good example of the breed. Remember, just because a horse is a Shetland doesn't mean it's a good Shetland. There are real horse shows, just like there are model horse shows, and horses are judged on their confirmation and their adherence to breed standards. If they were all 100% perfect, you wouldn't have these shows. There is a big difference between a Shetland pony that's won a horse of the year show and a Shetland pony that's hanging out in a riding school biting small children. They're both Shetland ponies, but one is a really good example of the breed and the other one is just an evil little annoyance. Still cute, but evil. Okay, so make sure your image is of a horse that's a good example of that breed. And the best place to find these images is usually uh, breeders' websites. Um, you can also make sure that your images are royalty free, get permission and stuff like that. Obviously, every time that you even look at an image online, you're committing a copyright infringement and you've got a temporary usage exception under EU law. But the moment you copy and paste this into a Word document, you have committed a copyright infringement. Most people are not going to care or notice, but you need to be aware of that when you're putting together breed cards. So, once you've found your image and you're happy with it, like this, you need to do the rest of your structure. So, remember that golden rule. What does the judge need to know? I would argue that there are only two core things that a judge needs to know. They need to know the colours that your breed comes in, because they need to know whether your horse would be accepted, and they need to know the confirmation, because they need to know whether your horse looks like that particular breed. Under colour, I would include things like whether white markings are allowed, what sort of white markings are allowed. It may be that there is a bit of variation between mares and stallions. If so, put that down. If you're making one for a particular breed and it's a mare, you don't need to include the information about stallions or geldings. If it's a stallion, you might want to put, well, actually, this isn't allowed or this is allowed. It really depends on your model in terms of whether you need to make that explicitly clear. So you can put things like all or all solid or coloured or spotted. Um, please be really, really careful and check that when a breed society says spotted, that they actually mean all spotted. Check that there aren't preferences. An example would be the Sugarbush Draft Horse. In the Sugarbush Draft Horse does allow both blanket and leopard spots. However, in a show where there are two horses of equal confirmational merit and one is leopard and one is blanket, the leopard is to be preferred over the blanket. So stuff like that is actually quite important for a judge to know if they don't know it already. And I would say that it's actually a little bit dishonest if yours is a blanket, that you're not making that clear on your breed card. Um, and I'd like to think that the judge would already know that was something like a sugar bush draft horse that's becoming increasingly common in the show ring. But those sort of things actually just include them because that level of honesty on your breed card makes you look good. And also as a judge, I actually respect seeing people who've gone to effort, they've done the proper research and they actually care about what they put on their card. For the confirmation, you don't need to put huge long paragraphs and loads and loads of detail. I would just put bullet points, outline what the head, neck, withers, back, um, quarters, legs, shoulder, just do that general stuff. You know, has it got a concave or a convex profile? Is it a short back? Has it got a smooth croup? If it's got things like the Breed Society says that it's got to have a luscious mane and tail, or maybe the Breed Society says sparse mane and tail, things like that. Maybe the breed society says that they've always got to be shown with like a hogged mane or they've got to be shown platted. Actually include that information on your breed card so that the judge knows it. Make sure you include anything else that is really relevant to your model. If your model is standing still, then you don't really need to include information about gates. But if I was say showing Mason here and I wanted to produce a breed card about the American Saddlebred, I definitely put in some information about what the gate is or what it looks like 
because that's actually relevant to the judge. If you've got a really unusual gated breed and its legs are in the wrong place, um, obviously not the wrong place for the gate, but the wrong place for your standard four gates, the judge needs to know that because otherwise they might not place your horse. If you want, at the end, you can put a little bit of background. So I've got a little bit of background here. I always include the height as well, and I don't think that's necessarily that relevant. I mean, I'm gonna be able to tell if it's a pony or a heavy horse or a light horse by looking at it and looking at the body type of your model. Um, but I always like to put that in because I think it's core key information for the breed, but you don't 100% need it. I, I don't think it's as relevant. Um, so yeah, you can put that in if you want, you don't have to. Um, the final thing to say, and I've said it before, check your sources. Make sure the information you've got on that card is correct. Judges will know if it's wrong. And judges can also, and are perfectly entitled, and will Google stuff. We've all got smartphones. The vast majority of time we actually have phone signal, depends on your show hall. Um, I will just look stuff up on a show. If I've got a horse in front of me, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, I don't think that breed allows white markings, or I don't think that breed comes in that colour, or I'm not 100% sure about this, I will just Google it and find the answer, and that could be to your detriment, or that could be to your advantage. But try not to let the judges Google. Give them the information they need so they don't have to Google. And don't try leaving stuff out or don't try putting stuff that's maybe not 100% correct. I don't think anyone does that deliberately. I think it's simply that they're using really unreliable sources. So go back, make sure you're using the official breed standard and check things like the distinctions between what the breed standard is for a mare and a gelding and a stallion. So I'm just gonna check and see if there are any questions. Before we move on to our last section, we're just going to look at some common pitfalls of breed allocation and putting together breed cards. So, Kristen said, how important is horse height to you? A couple of people told me to take it off my cards when I thought it was valuable information. Um, well, I think I've just addressed this, so hopefully that's answered your question. I don't think it's that important, but I do put it on all my breed cards. Um, some judges are really, really fussy. They do not like to see breed cards that have any irrelevant information. And actually, to be fair, if you're judging a class of 100 horse, um, horses and you are being made to read loads and loads of stuff, then that can be a little bit annoying. If you lay it out really clearly with like bullet points, then generally speaking, the judge can just not read that. They can see the word height and they can see that those are like hand markings and they can just go skip. Um, if you've written it all out like an essay, then they're probably more annoyed by the essay. But if you find a judge who says, leave this off the breed cards, just make sure that if you're showing under that judge again, you do leave it off your breed cards because it's obviously something they care about. And these things do have an impact. We don't talk much about subliminal influences in showing, but it's something we all know exists. It happens in real horse showing, it happens in dog showing, it happens in guinea pig showing, it happens in rabbit showing, it happens in everything that we do in our lives. We have all these subliminal things going on. And presentation of your models in the show ring, presentation with a good breed card, can actually make a difference because it draws that judge's attention and the judge is already thinking, oh yeah, no, that's a nice horse. And if they're already thinking that, they're going to be more inclined to place it, unless it's an awful horse. And we're going to talk a little bit about awful horses right at the end. So I'm gonna have a little bit of tea, because otherwise my voice is gonna go. And then we're gonna have a look at some of these pitfalls. Okay, so our first pitfall relates to my beautiful and beloved Shy. Say hello to everyone, Shy. Waited five years for this horse and I love him to pieces. But Shy in the hands of a less experienced owner could befall one of my most hated pet hates as a judge. And that is the difference between an Arab cross Appaloosa and a part bred Arab or an Araloosa. If you put down that your horse is an Arab cross Appaloosa, I am going to assume that it is 50% Arab, 50% Appaloosa. When you breed an Arab and an Appaloosa, as with anything else, you are going to get a baby that is a mix of both. Now, he might be born with beautiful spotty coloration, like my beloved Shy here, but he also might be born with a big fat bum, because Appaloosas have big fat bums, or a really straight face. 
face because Appaloosas have a really straight face or quite a sort of square sort of post-like build because Appaloosas have a square post-like build. He may not be refined and snorty and fancy in the same way an Arab is. He may not have that reduced number of vertebrae in his tail. All of these are factors that are going to influence what your horse looks like. Now, there are obviously going to be some pure 50-50 crosses that, for whatever reason, look 100% like an Appaloosa or 100% like an Arab. That's just a weird thing that happens in genetics. But the majority are going to look like a mix between them both. If you have what is essentially an Arab that has been painted to a spotted colour, it is not an Arab cross with an Appaloosa. It is an Araloosa or a PBA. Or it is a, say, 97% Arab, 3% Appaloosa. You can put percentages on, that is fine. There is a huge difference. And that can mean the difference between your horse placing and your horse not placing. For those who are not sure, registrations like the Araloosa, the um, Ara Appaloosa, the Pintabian and the Pintarabian are registrations of what are essentially part-bred Arabs um, but they are breeding for a specific colour and whether you agree with some of the stuff that's involved in that morally or not is, is sort of irrelevant here. But they're breeding for Arab confirmation. So your model needs to look confirmationally like an Arab, but with that particular colour characteristics. The same thing goes if I put down a pup bred Welsh in the show ring. If I'm judging something describes the pup bred Welsh that doesn't have the particular cross, I'm going to assume that it is a show type part bred Welsh, which is basically a purebred Welsh pony or a purebred Welsh A or a purebred Welsh B, but is in a different colour because that is how that terminology is used under British showing. So be really specific and be accurate. It's really, really important that you put the right thing down because if you don't, your horse could not place. So, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is how sometimes you can really fall foul of stupidness. And that stupidness mainly relates to the word spotted. But we're going to miss that out today and we're going to talk about the word cream in the American Cream Draft Registry. Now, for those who don't know anything about colour genetics, Cream is a particular genetic component of horses that when horses carry one or two copies, it alters their coloration. So a chestnut horse like Ashqua here, if he had a cream gene, would be a Palomino horse like my beautiful Zane. He could also be a Cremello if he had two copies of the gene. So naturally, if I have a breed registry called the American Cream Draft, without doing any research, I am going to assume that that means that they are cream. So I might look at this guy here and go, OK, he's kind of looks like a Percheron, but he's buckskin. I know. Why don't I show him as an American Cream Draft cross Percheron? The American Cream Draft will have the cream gene. The Percheron will have black, bay, uh, okay, all right, there's other issues there, but I'm trying to use an example. I'll put them together and bish, bash, bosh, all good. But I haven't done my research. The American cream draft does not come in cream. It comes in champagne. Big difference. Very big difference. Two completely different colours. Not only are they two completely different colours, champagne has the irritating characteristic that the horse has to have hazel eyes. So unless your horse has hazel coloured eyes, it's not an American cream draft. It's just a pot bread of unknown origin that you're going to have difficulty breeding. I see this one a lot and I see it more than I see things like American spotted drafts <coughs> being shown as like spotted as in um, shy here, spotted, because most people are able to recognise that. A cream and a champagne can often look really, really similar. So when you're Googling it, actually, if you haven't read the breed standard, you can fall foul of this. 
and it may not actually be something the judge knows. So these are the kind of pitfalls that you need to be really, really careful about. The next pitfall is white markings. This is Tina. You can all say hello to Tina. Tina is a pain in the bum. Why is Tina a pain in the bum? Because Tina is quite a nice little Percheron, lovely Percheron. But some genius at Brea decided that Tina would look beautiful, and I mean she kind of does, with a white stripe and four white socks. Percherons can't have a white stripe and four white socks. The Percheron breed standard, at least in the UK and in France, it's a bit different in the USA, but I'm, I'm English, so we're going to stick with that, says minimal white. That, that, that ain't minimal white. She had a tiny, tiny white star. I can maybe get away with it. She's a mare after all, but I'm not getting away with this. There is no way I'm going to get away with that. And that's why research is important and proper research. I could look at the spread standard and go, OK, they allow black. Beautiful. Brilliant. It looks like it. I'll put it in. But I actually need to check that. The white markings are a pitfall, particularly with heavy horses that I see a lot. I quite often see things like Percherons, Veldendrafts and things like that shown um, with white markings that they can't have. Another quite common thing <coughs> is um, greys that have got obviously got a base colour that isn't accepted in the breed. So things like mulberry greys or greys that are quite were quite obviously a chestnut. So you do see that with some uh, grey horses and grey models actually their breed standards says black so although it says black and grey the horses were all black when they're born and quite a good example of that would be the Camargue um, Camargues are black and occasionally some of them don't go grey and they stay black um, but generally speaking they should all have a black base so you do need to check these little things two more pitfalls to go through this I've just talked to you all through breed cards and you should be able to look at this and you'll be falling off your chairs in shock and horror that I would ever produce such an appalling piece of paper. This disgusting piece of paper is the worst type of breed card. I spend most of my days reading and marking essays. I do not want to go to a live show and read more essays. I really don't. I mean, it's great that your great, great, great grandmother was the original breeder of the first ever Percheron with a pink nose or some, well, I don't know, whatever. I don't care. What I want to know is what colour does it come in and what does it look like? And I want that information clearly presented. As I said before, some classes can be massive. Some people, I mean, I've judged classes that have definitely exceeded 50 or 60 horses, but some people could be judging classes where there are over 100. They're not going to read an essay for every breed card. Please don't make them read an essay for every breed card. Because if they have to do that, it takes 10 times longer to judge. And then everyone is there at 7 o'clock in the evening and they just want to go home. So be nice. Be concise. No essays. Finally. I'm really sad to report this. But not every model horse is going to do well at a live show. Try as you might, you're probably not going to find a breed for Veronica here. I bought her because she had a silly name. I didn't buy him, him, I call her her, she's called Veronica, um, to show. And I, I really can't show her. There's not a good mix that works. Other horses are quite frankly an abomination to model horse kind. I mean look at it. I'm sorry Schleich, but I don't know who sculpted this, but I don't think they've ever seen a horse before in their entire life. This thing looks like it needs to be put out of its misery. I mean, if that was real, those legs would break. I, I mean, I actually know a real horse that does look like this, and honestly, I do think it should be put out of its misery. The worst thing, though, is not the weird spindly legs and the awful body. It's that if you look at it from this angle, the legs are actually all different lengths and it's not just the position. I could measure these and they'd all be different lengths, which is probably why she doesn't stand up. I can allocate the most wonderful breed in the world. I could put together the most beautiful breed card. I could do the most incredible research. But this little girl here, she ain't going to place at a live show. And if she does, I would suggest that the judge needs that eyes checked or that it was a class of horse, but most not likely needs to be put out of its misery.
That is just the reality of showing. You may have some beautiful models in your collection and they may be stunning, they may be expensive. You may have bought them from another country where they were showing well. But that doesn't mean they're going to show well now. It doesn't mean if they were showing well 10 years ago that all the judges are biased against you if your horse isn't placing now. Frankly, sometimes horses just don't place. Sometimes classes are so competitive that your horse that's absolutely stunning isn't placing because it's not absolutely stunning. It's not placing because there are 30 horses on that mould and actually there's very little between them. That's just the reality of showing. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this seminar. Hopefully it's gone relatively glitch free. Hopefully you've been able to hear and see me. So we're going to finally finish off with a Q and A. So if you've got any burning questions you want to ask, post them in the chat and I will have a look through and address any of them. You can also use that discussion post to continue the discussion afterwards, have a chat, share some models you're struggling to breed, allocate to, um, and discuss any of the points raised in this seminar. So I'm going to have a look at any questions, see if anyone's got any, and respond to them. Victoria called my horse a teapot. Wow, Vicky. Wow. That is just rude. I'm actually upset. And guess what you're getting for Christmas? One of these. That is what happens when you have friends in the model horse hobby. They insult your horses. I'd like to point out that someone once said that my horse needed to be shot. Um, I mean, in, in a nice way, but oh, I'll have a scroll and see if anyone has any genuine questions. Thank you. Alana says preach. Totally. Um, judges are great. Yes, they are. Actually, most judges are really happy to help you. Um, there are some grumpy, angry people out there in the world, and sometimes I'm one of them. Sometimes I've been up since 3 a.m. in the morning, I've had two hours sleep, I'm tired and I just wanna go home and it's five o'clock and I really don't care anymore. We've all been there. But most of the time, judges really want to help you. They want to help you show your model well. They're not, not placing your model because they don't like you. They're not placing your model because of a myriad of different reasons. Sometimes they might not place your model because you've done something really stupid and put your Shetland pony down as a highland because your brain went like that. Or, as I did and I was asked why I didn't place a model uh, whilst judging in February, you've put your very nice American saddlebred as a Tennessee walking horse, Teresa. And, you know, as a judge, I can't place it because it's completely the wrong breed. That doesn't mean your horse isn't lovely. So yeah, generally ask judges for advice. If they don't place your horse and you want to know why, ask them. I had a situation um, back when I first started judging, a really experienced hobbyist came up to me and was like, why did you not place my horse? And I was actually really like, oh, okay. But the reason I didn't place it is because it had a chip on its nose and she actually hadn't even noticed that. I was able to point it out to her. She was able to get the model fixed. So sometimes it is worth asking because there may be things about your model that you don't know and you simply haven't noticed like ear rubs or chips. Sometimes you just haven't looked at it that well or you look at it all the time so you don't really notice those things. I judged one um, a couple of weeks ago that had glitter on it and the owner had no idea that it was covered in glitter and I suggested that maybe the glitter should be removed. Okay, let's have a look. Loads of new comments, uh, a rabbit. Um, I've been told to show my Tunbridge Royals um, just as a cop. Yes, 100%. Cop is an absolutely perfect breed allocation. Um, I would maybe suggest show cop for Tunbridge Wells, um, just because um, that's what I think he looks like. I really love a Tunbridge Wells. I'd really like one. So if anyone's got one for sale, hit me up at one more. Um, but yeah, cob is perfectly fine. It's also perfectly fine to write down, um, I'm talking about in the UK here, it might be different in the US, to write down Heinz 57. Um, anyone who walks into a riding school in this country is gonna see a myriad of weird looking ponies and they are not a particular breed. They're just a thing that, I, I don't even know who breeds half these things. <laughs> They're just bizarre, but they are just a thing. So Heinz 57, Cobb, You'll see variations of that. You'll see things like Gypsy Cob. That's another pitfall, Believe, be aware that there's a big difference between a Gypsy Vanner, which is a registered breed in the US, although we do still put them in part bred in the UK, and a Gypsy Cob. 
A Gypsy Banner is a much lighter breed. Uh, very elegant, very beautiful looking horses. Whilst a Gypsy Cob is the kind of thing I'm expecting to see on like a roundabout on the A14. Um, it's going to be a lot more of a like small, hairy, sort of more generic pony type thing. So all of those terms are absolutely fine. Terms like hack, terms putting things like PBA, a judge should know standards for judging a PBA. Um, some judges do want specific crosses, but as a judge, I'm, I'm going to know exactly. If I'm judging a PBA, I'm going to be judging it exactly the same as I'd judge a PBA if I was in the show ring looking at real part-bred Arabs. Those sort of things, yeah, I would say absolutely fine. Uh, finally, breeds for show pony type breeds. Riding ponies seem to be part bred. Um, yeah, so in the UK, um, show ponies and part um, riding ponies are shown in part bred. Um, you are perfectly fine and you should be putting down things like show pony or riding pony. Those are absolutely fine, but they will go in the part bred classes. Or some shows have like a pony type class. Um, and more specialist shows like um, our British breed show, we, we do have specific classes for riding ponies and show ponies. But putting down riding pony or putting down show pony is absolutely fine. But yeah, they are going to go in part bred pony if there isn't a particular class for those. I think it's really sad in the UK that we don't actually see a lot of um, what we'd see in the real horse show ring necessarily reflected in our own show ring. If we had more riding ponies, we have more show ponies, we have more hacks and hunters and show cops, all of those things, we'd actually start to see those splits could start to come in at shows and then they may get their own specific classes. Um, but it's more likely than not you're just going to be getting a red pony. Um, yeah, no, your cards, Vicky, are not lacking in being bullet pointed. Please bullet points, no paragraphs. Um, how would you document uh, Heinz 57? Okay, so there are judges who want you to give the exact reading of a model. But as a judge and as a show host and as somebody sat on the BMX committee, I've never had an objection to that. And I don't think judges should. If you go and ask 90% of horse owners, they don't know the breeding of their horse. It's just a cob. It's just a thing it, like they bought it at the sales for 200 quid and it's adorable and maybe it's actually doing prelim dressage but it's not a particular breed um the same obviously goes with things like warm bloods british warm bloods are basically anything american warm bloods are literally anything that can vaguely go over a jump or do a dressage test there's generic breed associations with open registries um in terms of documenting um, an example, I haven't got the breed card here, would be my Comtois cross. So I actually, whilst Googling, found, and this is, I just made me laugh, I found this guy's blog where he'd taken a picture of a very nice um, silver chestnut Comtois cross. Now he knew the mare, because the mare was a Comtois, he didn't have a clue who the father was. He thinks it might have been his neighbour's horse, but he's not really sure, and I just, I mean, I love that story. But I've been showing her as a Comtois cross. I've added the reference picture and I put that's what I put on my breed card to the judge. I say Comtois cross unknown father. Putting unknown breeding is per, should be perfectly acceptable. If there are judges that are saying you've got to put it as this breeding, maybe just don't show under them or just um, show it as something else or come up with a mix of different things. I mean, you could, um, if it's like quite a generic cobby prony, put down like 10 different British native breeds. Um, but I, I really don't think you need to. Um, it can be hard as a judge um, if you've got something that's described as that. But I have in my head a kind of vague idea of what I would be looking for in something described as a Heinz 57. And the way I would describe it is if I walked into a riding school and looked at the ponies that I see in a riding school, that's kind of what I would be looking at um, in that. And I'm going to judge it more on like the way it's put together, it's confirmation, that kind of thing. So, oh, how should we do crossbreed reference? Really good question, Gemma. And I was going to cover that and I forgot. So like this. Obviously, if they're unusual breeds, you can give a bit more information. But this is a really simple crossbreed reference. Note the giant cross. Please don't put two breed cards next to each other 
and expect me to realise that what you mean is that those two horses are a 50-50 cross when there are like three horses in front of them. It gets really, really confusing if you do that. So make specific breed cards for them. All I've got here is I've got the name of the two breeds. I've got Cladribur and a Campolina. It's a really weird mix, but it works amazingly well for this horse. Um, and then I've just got a photograph under here of the two breeds. Um, what I try and look for in the photographs is I try and look for two examples that I kind of in my brain imagine that if they mushed would look like my horse. So normally when I'm doing part breeds, I can sort of see the mix in my head or I've got an idea of what I'm looking for. Um, I think a lot of this just comes with experience and comes with the judge's eye. I can normally look at a model and go, that's what that looks like, or that I, fit, that I feel like there's breeding from there coming in, but it looks like there maybe is breeding from here. Um, so that model could be shown as a purebred. Plenty of people show her as a purebred, but I choose to show her as a partbred because in my head, that's what she looks like to me. So that's, that is simply what I would do for a partbred free card. Nothing more complicated than that. Make your X nice and big though. Um, what about deliberate stylization of a model? How does that fit into a show? So it's a really interesting one, isn't it? Um, judges should be judging as if that horse is a real horse. And that is what we're aiming for with live showing. We're aiming on judging a horse against a real horse breed standard. So if you've got something that's a bit more fancy, if you've got something where um, the artist has used artistic license like this, because obviously that's what the artist was doing, they were using artistic license, <laughs> um, you're going to probably have a bit more trouble showing that model. And maybe you just need to accept that it's a really beautiful shelf piece, but it's not going to be a show horse. I really love some moulds that are not really show moulds. I really love the sham mould. But it's not, it's not a good show horse. I know it's not a good show horse. Um, I actually quite like chemo sausage. He's adorable. But I'm not, I don't like him to show him. I'm not buying him to show him. In the same way I didn't buy Veronica's vodka because I wanted to show her. I bought her because she had a funny name, which is a totally justifiable reason to buy a model horse. So you've got to be really aware of that. What you could think about is workmanship. Now, most judges in workmanship, now I know there's another school of thought with workmanship, um, but I've only ever met one judge that uses that school of thought. So we're going to go with what I think is the mainstream in the UK, which is that they are going to be judging on either the finished work or if there's customization, then they're going to be wanting it to look like the real horse. But if it's just a repaint of a really stylized resin, they're going to be judging it on that repaint. So they might judge this guy, um, and he's done quite well in some workmanship classes because he's lush. Um, you know, they might look at the subtle dappling, they might look at the white markings and the detail on the hooves and the detail in the eyes. If he's spotted like Shay here, they will, as I infamously was overheard telling like a 12 year old child, need to make sure he's got a spotty bottom. Um, they will be looking for things like that, painted chestnuts, um, really important. So you could start thinking about workmanship if it's an OF, maybe if it's a really rare one, you might be starting to think about something like collectability. Um, or you could just accept that you love it and it's not about show results. It's about owning stuff that you really love. How do you feel about models that are shown under another country's breed standard? I a shy a horse that is chestnut, which is allowed in USA breed standards. Oh, Lynn, you're going to get me attacked from areas of the internet for the, talking about this. Do you mean... Do you mean like this one? Okay, I actually show this as an American Shire across Clydesdale, um, just so I can annoy people. Um, yeah, this is a really, really tricky one. I think the real question is whether they go in pure or part bread. And I think that's where you're gonna hit real controversy. And there are some people that are in the UK that are really emotive about things like American Shires being chestnut. Um, th there are with real horse showing and with breed societies and I think it is just the kind of people that these things attract and we definitely sit in the model horse hobby you get a very absolutist point of view things shouldn't progress things is how they are um, and I think we can really see that reflected with the gypsy banners gypsy banners I, I would be surprised if in my lifetime I saw model horse shows putting gypsy banners in purebreds 
However, we quite happily put a Georgian Grand in a purebred class, despite the fact that it's a far more modern breed um, development than the Gypsy Manor is. But there's an emotion level going on there and people get really angry about it. So if someone came to one of my shows and they put in Other Heavy and American Shire, as a judge, I don't really care. And as um, a show holder, I don't really care. I'd probably ask you to move it out of British because it's not a British breed. But you go to someone else's shows and they're going to tell you to either put it on part bread or get out of the show and never you know cross their doors again with your evil american shires so i think that's a really hard one and i think with a lot of these things it's about maybe sort of gauging it and getting to know the show holders a little bit if they're younger generally they might be more accepting of some of the new developments but yeah definitely sort of gauge it and and sort of you have to start to get to know the personalities and maybe it means that you don't take it to shows because you know that it's going to cause aggro and just sometimes it's just better to avoid these things in this hobby there's enough problems in the world right now do you need a breed card in a class that is just for that breed no there we go simple um generally speaking unless the horse is an unusual breed or an unusual color you do not need a breed card in the UK, um, for mixed breed classes, we actually, because we don't tag in the UK, we actually just use post-it notes or slips of paper and just write the breed down. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, you don't need breed cards for the majority of horses. Um, and most judges will ignore them. Um, a lot of people like to produce them just because they find a picture that really looks like their horse. Um, so they want to put it in. So Shai here ha is, a a direct portrait of a horse that looks identical to him um so obviously i have that in front so the judge can look at it because i'm saying to the judge look look that that they look the same but yeah generally no do you prefer four square confirmation picks or action i like four square confirmation picks but if your horse is in an action pose, I don't see any reason why you can't go and try and find one in that action pose. So an example is this. Um, obviously, I can't show you these photos, which makes it quite hard. But you can sort of see this is a still taken from a video. And that's because the horse is in quite an unusual pose. Um, so I'm trying to highlight to the judge that actually, like when it's doing this movement, it does look like this. Sometimes with really unusual movements as well, the confirmation can look really off. So if you can find a horse that looks like that, kind of like with Shy, um, then that might actually be helpful to the judge to show, yeah, okay, it looks like its shoulder is a bit dislocated, but actually if you look, that's just what a horse looks like in that pose. Um, but 99.9% .9 of the time, I want a nice, clear, square-on photo of a really good example of the breed, like a beautiful, well-presented stallion or something. Um, do you include exclusions on the document if they don't apply to the model, such as no Tobianos, but your model is solid? Um, if you're making it for a specific model, no, I wouldn't bother including that because it's not really relevant information. Um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't. I've already said, like, don't include exclusions if you're trying to make sure the judge places your horse and your horse falls into one of those exclusions. Just find another breed. Um, but you don't need loads and loads of detail. You can put for like Shetland Pony all colours except Spotted and Champagne. You might put, you know, um, no Tobianos or all coloured patterns except Tobiano or um, all solid. Um, so if you put all solid, that necessarily implies that there are no or the others. You could put Overo only or Splash White only or something like that. But you don't need to include every single exclusion if it doesn't necessarily apply to your model. Um, how big should picks be when trying to reference crosses? Can't fit all the picks on an A5. Vicky, how many breeds are going into your horse? Okay, this is A5 and it's two breeds. Um, if you're fitting 80,000 breeds into your horse, then you're just annoying, Vicky. Um, don't go bigger than A5, seriously. Like, tables are only that big, particularly if it's a stable mate. I mean, I do this as well, actually. I'll slap, a bre I'll slap a breed card like this down and put a micro mini on it. Half the time, actually, the reason I'm putting breed cards down next to micro minis is because some of mine are so small, the judge misses them. So actually, that is another use for breed cards. We've got very, very small models. It could be a good way of being like, my horse is here, please judge it. Um, 
Yeah, Vicky, just make the picture smaller. All right, if needs be, I'll put my reading glasses on. I don't have access to a printer, so my read cards on my Kindle. Most judges are okay with that, but I've had one or two say it has to be printed. I make sure the screen doesn't shut off for 30 minutes, fixing the screen and the readable size. What is your opinion on this? Go for it. I have no objection to this. I use my phone like so many times in shows because I've forgotten my read cards. Obviously, if you whack down a massive laptop, I'd say like this Chromebook is probably too big, but um, Kindles are quite small. So I would say, yeah, um, you know, if you've forgotten it or you don't have access to a printer, um, I don't have any objections to that. Again, if you're showing under some judges that do have objections to that, then maybe just learn and, you know, if you can use a library printer or get a friend to print it out for you and bring it to the show. Um, you know, I'm always willing to get stuff printed, to print stuff out if people are like really desperate. Obviously, if you tell me to print a hundred, I won't. But, you know, if you need something printed last minute before a show and I'm going, I usually, if I'm online, will um, will help you out with that. And people are usually willing to do that. Um, so maybe for those judges, I know it's really hard with British shows because judging lists are not often not released in advance. And it can be really tricky. But if you know they're going, then maybe sort of take that into account. Um, and just try and sort of play along. Uh, thank you, inspirational. Well, I know. If a class is thoroughbred or quarter horse, is it worth putting the breed card? Generally speaking, no. Um, if you were showing a quarter horse with heavy white, you might want to put it down. If you were showing a thoroughbred in a more unusual colour, such as maybe a cream dilute, or a coloured thoroughbred, whoo, risky. Um, they do exist. I know there are certain people who are going to have a go at me for even thinking of mentioning that. Um, yeah, then you would put it down. But I'd say generally speaking, no. I'm, I would assume that judges know around 100 breeds. They should know. If you've got someone judging who doesn't know what a thoroughbred look like, looks like, they shouldn't be judging. And that sounds really nasty, but like there is basic stuff. I think anyone in the UK needs to know the breed standard for all the British native breeds. Arabs, thoroughbreds, quarter horses, Appaloosas, paints, your generic gated breeds, um, things like Mustangs, um, most of the heavy horse breeds from Europe. You should be, you should know all that stuff. I wouldn't necessarily expect a judge to know too much detail about a Mangalaga Markador, but I would expect them to know what an American Saddlebred is. So um, yeah, I think for breed classes like that, you don't need it. Um, as a judge, I might overlook it unless there's something in particular that I want to look up. It may be that I just look at your photo. A lot of the time I just look at the photo and be like, why have they put a breed garden a photo down? Okay, yeah, that kind of does look, look up, like that horse, but I don't like it, so I'm just gonna ignore it. I'm quite an independent judge. I, do, I tend to ignore people's breed cards quite a lot. Um, okay, so I don't think there are any more questions. Really good questions, guys. Um, I hope you've really enjoyed this seminar. If you've got any more questions, use that discussion thread. So next week's seminar, I think I'm going to have to move them. Unfortunately, for some reason, my neighbours have decided that every Saturday they have to drill through this wall. Um, I, I honestly expect them to literally come through the wall one day. I don't know what they're doing. They've been doing it for over a year. I don't even want to know what they're doing. Um, but I think I'm going to have to move this to another day. And I'm thinking about Fridays. Um, if you've got a massive objection to Fridays, put that in the discussion thread and be like, I hate Fridays. Um, but that will just mean that I can do it at different times throughout the day. Because I know some people, for some people, 5 p.m. isn't great. So, um, yeah, so just have a look at that discussion thread. And I will obviously put it on the Chestnut Ridge Facebook page and update that blog post um, if, you know, if I need to change it. The final thing to say is that if you head onto the free downloads page of our website and a post will have gone up eight minutes ago on the Chestnut Ridge page with a link, you can get a template um, that you can download to use for breed cards. And after every seminar, there will be um, a link to something more permanent on the Chestnut Ridge site, whether it's a free download or maybe a kit to make whatever we've done in that seminar or um, a more detailed guide with photographs. Um, those will be there for you to look at just to support you through making those decisions. So I think, uh, yeah, I think we are all done. I hope you've had an amazing time. I've really enjoyed this. I um, hope that these are going to be popular. If there are any subjects you want to see, make sure you tell me. Um, as long as I can do it and I can talk about it, um, I will definitely do them. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I will see you.